Hello and welcome uh, as we come perhaps at this time to look at uh, the readings for uh, Easter Sunday. But I hope that uh, those of you who are watching this have an opportunity to uh, take part of the Triduum uh, celebrations, uh, certainly um, Holy Thursday, but most importantly, the uh, Easter Vigil celebration. Now, it's with that in mind that I'm going to give, <clears throat> to, as we begin, a series of readings. <clears throat> uh, the Easter Vigil, which um, has a number of different readings, but here are some that we uh, might well be using and that maybe you would be interested in. Uh, there are going to be four Old Testament or Hebrew Bible uh, readings. The first is from Genesis chapter 1, the story of creation. Uh, second reading from Genesis chapter 22, <clears throat> the story of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, number three from the book of Exodus chapter 14, the story of the um, <clears throat> uh, crossing of, of the sea. <clears throat> and uh, then a reading from one of the uh, writings of uh, Isaiah. Uh, it could be 54 chapter, it could be chapter 55, uh, and there are a couple of others. And then the New Testament reading for the Easter Vigil is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 3 through 11, and the gospel is Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. We're going to talk a little bit of, um, about that. Now, if you're looking at the Easter Sunday, then here are the readings for that um, liturgy. It's Acts 10, verses 34a through, and then <laughs> verse, through um, 37 through 43. Uh, then the second reading could either be, and there's a variety here, either from Colossians 3, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, or from Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 66 through uh, 68. And then the gospel is from the uh, gospel according to John chapter 20, verse 1 through 9. All right. So... We're not going to be able to cover everything, but I would like to make a few comments. First of all, on the Easter Vigil uh, reading from Mark, which also that gospel could be used on Easter Sunday. So although there's a specific uh, gospel assigned for the day of Easter, there is a, a, a choice there, okay? Now, the gospel according to Mark Pictures very early in the uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, <clears throat> the uh, mother of James, the younger, and Joseph, the Sa Salome, coming to the tomb. All right. And when they get there, as they're going there, they ask the question, who will roll the stone back for us? Now, <clears throat> these three women are, of course, important in the gospel tradition, according to Mark. First one is Mary Magdalene, who is, by the way, mentioned always in all four of the gospels as being there on um, the morning of the resurrection. Um, we know that another, uh, it's interesting, she is called Mary Magdalene. Some call her Mary the Tower because um, the town Magdala means the Tower of Fishes. And so that, if that's the place where she came from, maybe that's one way of, of addressing her. Because the city was well known, Magdala, as you know, for preserving fish by salting. And uh, they, then they exported the product. And that made Magdala a very um, important and rich uh, city at the time that we are uh, of Jesus. The three women are sort of redundant uh, in that they had already been there, had witnessed, remember we mentioned this last time, 
had witnessed uh, Jesus dying on the cross, had two of them had noticed where Jesus was um, laid, buried, and now here on the morning, for the first day of the week, are coming to the tomb. When they arrive, they find that the stone is rolled back, and <clears throat> they enter the tomb and find <clears throat> sitting on the place where the body was, a young man dressed in white on the right side. Now, all of those are, of course, interesting. Who is this young man dressed in white? Later on, the other evangelists will call it him an angel. But um, remember that in the garden story, in the Garden of Gethsemane, there had been a young man whom they had tried to arrest, had run away, leaving behind his linen cloth, um, and he had run naked. Now you find this young man back, uh, a young man dressed again in uh, linen. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of uh, interpretations as to exactly who this young man is, okay? And um, you can kind of check that out. One uh, very popular one is that the young man um, uh, was uh, the same who had run away in the garden, and now, now he is back. He tells the women that you are looking for Jesus. He is not here. He goes before you, as he said, to the Galilee. All right, so there is this uh, er, uh, coming of the women. They're meeting with the young man. They leave. Um, and remember that uh, the words that he has said, they, they remember the words of Jesus who had said earlier, after I am raised, I will go before you to the Galilee. So in fact, the messenger here repeats what Jesus had said so that, uh, that they would know where they might uh, meet Jesus. Now, the women leave the tomb and um, go out, they are amazed and fearful. Now it's interesting, by the way, this opening uh, eight verses for our reading is only going to be the first seven. For various reasons, the last verse is left out because what it says is that the women went out amazed and frightened and they told no one. And that's the way it ends. Um, and that's uh, a very disturbing ending for some because there's no picture of the resurrection of Jesus. There's no meeting with him. And the fact that the women leave in amazement, which is a typical word that Mark likes to use, you remember, throughout his gospel. We will see that as we look throughout the rest of the coming year. But also fearful and they tell no one. Now, that of course, um, what? They tell no one. But uh, it might be interesting, is it not, that earlier on in this gospel, Jesus had told people uh, when he healed them not to tell anyone, and that really telling someone not to do anything only encourages them to do that. So that may have been a little bit of a ploy that uh, Mark uses here. Or it could be, and this is another way in which this gospel is interpreted, they tell no one because the message about the risen Lord is placed into the hands of the hearer. And if you want to get what the message should, should be, go back to the opening line of this gospel, which says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord. So um, is this really what the gospel writer hoped that he would put the mission of being disciples of the kingdom uh, into the hands of the hearer? All right, so all of that are possible reasons why this rather abrupt ending of Mark's story begins. In fact, uh, earlier, as we moved toward the end of the first century, there were those who did not like this ending, and so uh, added what we know as um, two endings. 
This, therefore, is chapter 16, brings us verses 9 through 20. And there is what is known as a shorter ending and a longer ending. Now, um, again, uh, you can kind of check this out and see that many, uh, certainly when you read the Gospel of Mark, we'll see that it's there. Um, why do we know that these endings were added? Well, a couple who study the language here is that the style of these endings is not Markan, the vocabulary is not Markan, and however, the, this positive ending, uh, what does it include, by the way? Apparitions of Jesus, where they see him. And so that kind of uh, matches what one finds in the other Gospels and therefore um, leaves people satisfied. So I, 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 I tell you that. Um, one can see again the uh, development of this little episode as typical of Markin. The women are, um, in fact, the tomb. And what they find is an empty tomb. And this, of course, as I mentioned, is central to the narrative. They are concerned, as we saw, about why the stone is rolled away. Um, the women encounter uh, this young man who says he is risen. Uh, so therefore, they don't find a disabled spirit or disembodied spirit, but he is, in fact, transfigured. And again, keep in mind in this gospel, uh, the transfiguration of Jesus, where indeed he was seen by his disciples in a new way. So uh, as if this is the reading that is used at the Easter Vigil Mass, and as I mentioned, possibly could be used on Easter Sunday. Um, the, uh, now, uh, moving to the assigned gospel for Easter Sunday is um, that according to John. Now, uh, we will be hearing John's gospel not only um, this week, but also for the uh, second Sunday of uh, Easter. The, go the chapter 20 of John's gospel breaks to up into four parts. So we'll just give this, because remember our discussions here are really looking at the biblical uh, or New Testament development, not simply what will be uh, the proclamation of homilies on uh, Easter Sunday. So it begins, this is chapter 21, with verses 1 through 18, which is Easter Sunday morning. This is followed with verses 19 through 23, which is Easter Sunday evening. This is followed uh, in verses 24 through 29, eight days later. And this concludes with verses 30 through the 31 of a preliminary conclusion. Now, why do I call it a preliminary conclusion? Because added to the Johannine Gospel is an extra chapter, chapter 21. Uh, we will not be talking a lot about that, but nevertheless, kind of giving a little overview of the Johannine Gospel. All right, so what do we find uh, this time in looking at um, the Gospel assignment? We find Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb of Jesus very early in the morning before sunrise. Now, in this gospel, she comes to the tomb alone. In the other gospel, she is accompanied by um, a couple of the women. There is no reason given as to why Mary is coming uh, to the tomb because technically the anointing of Jesus' body had been done already. One remembers that, again, you have to back up a little bit to see um, what had taken place before this, but Joseph of Arimathea had come and Nicodemus um, had come with a um, hundred pounds of um, aloes. So the anointing of Jesus' body had been taken place. The customary tradition, according to Judaism, was complete. So Mary would not have been coming to the tomb for that reason. 
which is given in the other Gospels as one of the possible reasons why uh, they were coming. Now, so is it out of her grief, out of her love for Jesus, just to kind of be once more to the place where, where he was laid? Um, we don't know. You can fill in the blanks. Yeah. But this episode uh, of Mary Magdalene, by the way, is one of the more poignant of all of the um, episodes recorded in the uh, fourth gospel. Now, keep in mind also in the fourth gospel that Jesus is buried in a garden. Uh, the fourth gospel writer is very aware that the events that happen in this garden is a new beginning. And uh, you don't have to have a great deal of biblical background to remember that the opening story of Genesis, um, <clears throat> at least in chapter two, begins in a garden. And it is there that God creates the first women and man, and uh, it is there that the story um, uh, began. So, uh, in a garden. Now, Mary comes and finds that the uh, tomb, that the stone is rolled back. She notices, but she does not enter, that something is wrong. That, and her thought, by the way, it's interesting, is that the body of Jesus has been taken, that in some way there's been a theft. What she does now is immediately goes and to the place where the disciples are. It's interesting, she knows where they are. <laughs> uh, we don't know. Uh, John would suggest it's the upper room where the supper had taken place, but again, she apparently knows where they are. Isn't that kind of, uh, this is a fill in the blank. It's not uh, really indicated in the gospel at all. However, two of the disciples, namely Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved or who is known as the beloved disciples, uh, immediately go uh, to the tomb. It is pictured that the other disciple whom Jesus loved gets to the tomb uh, first, ahead of Peter. It's also interesting in, the, in this opening episode that people are running. Mary Magdalene runs to tell the disciples. The disciples, not two disciples, run to get to the tomb. Although the other disciple gets there first, he does not enter. He waits uh, for Peter. When uh, Peter arrives, then both of them go in. They find the uh, cloth uh, or cloth that had kind of enraptured the body of Jesus, neatly folded um, one on one side and then the veil that covered his face on the other. The disciple whom Jesus loved comes in. He looks, sees, and believes. And it's that uh, Peter just doesn't do anything. He just kind of notices and they leave. Now, that's where the gospel this time ends. What I would like to suggest is that there's a little bit of a follow-up that involves uh, Mary of Magdala um, in this opening Easter Sunday morning, okay? And as I'm saying, this was uh, really the first act of uh, that John is, is presenting to us. All right, and one might uh, pause a moment before we go back to Mary Magdalene. Why uh, is the cloth rolled up and nicely put in place that the disciple notices? Keep in mind that, uh, that John likes to use parallel stories. Earlier on, before Jesus' arrest, and remember that there had been a dinner or a supper at their house, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And when Lazarus had come out of the tomb, he was totally wrapped in the burial shroud uh, that had placed him there. And Jesus says, unwrap him. Um, so Lazarus needs someone to get him back again. You can kind of almost picture 
the wrapped up uh, Lazarus standing there and then needing others to unravel the, uh, materi the material that had uh, embalmed him and placed him into the tomb. So in that sense, Lazarus needed help in order to get out of the um, burial shroud. In this case, Jesus obviously needed no help. And not only, perhaps as his uh, mother, and I just add this, as his mother had told him, when you get out of bed in the morning, uh, make your bed and put it nicely in place. Well, is that what Jesus had done as he rose, puts the garments in, uh, or the bed, burial material in the right place. So I simply mention that, that there's a kind of parallelism that is part of the um, Jomanine tradition, and um, that might be one reason why the, the, the emphasis on clothing or cloth is uh, made here, because we might just pass over it and say, really, does, does it really um, matter? We're not sure who the disciple is, by the way, who accompanies Peter. Um, it is the disciple whom Jesus loved, but as we have noted on other occasions, um, we're not sure who this is. Is this the same one who stood at the foot of the cross with Mary and at the time of Jesus' death? Well, some would say that, but uh, again, one cannot be uh, definitely uh, clear about this. All right, now um, these two are gone. We're not sure whether they run back. We're not sure what they actually do um, because the next episode will find them uh, in the upper room on the night of Easter. Mary Magdalene is now suddenly back. We're not quite sure um, where she was in this. Had she come with the other two and kind of stood to the side? Um, again, that is not uh, clear, but it would be interesting to know. Anyway, Mary is now, this time, looks into the tomb and sees inside the tomb um, an angel who, um, and uh, she addresses him she says, and, and again, her understanding of what has happened to Jesus is that there has been some kind of a theft. Um, she says to him, well, if, if look, um, what, what, what has happened here? Where is uh, Jesus? By the way, uh, also please notice that Mary Magdalene as we open this, comes before sunrise, while it is still dark. Keep in mind in this gospel how frequently darkness has given way to light. In fact, the famous story of Nicodemus early on in chapter 3 had come to see Jesus in the night while it was dark. Dark means a kind of ignorance and unawareness of things. Moving into the light brings, of course, vision and understanding. So um, is this, again, a Johannine theme? Darkness represents unbelief. Um, light, of course, be, uh, the opposite would be belief. So um, with the disciples gone and uh, the announcement now looking in, Mary sees someone, she turns around and sees Jesus. And she, thinking he is the gardener, that's why I mentioned earlier on, the burial place as John sees it is a garden. And so therefore it would be logical that there would be a, a gardener. Again, thinking that a theft has place, taken place, she says to um, the figure, if you have taken his body, tell me where you have laid it and I will take care of it. So um, it is uh, kind of all of that that lies uh, behind her question. Then Jesus says, Mary, and at that moment comes a recognition, and Mary says, Rabboni. 
and uh, there is this really wonderful meeting. And this is the first apparition that is remembered uh, in the Gospels, the uh, meeting of Mary, Mag Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, and Jesus. Now, the next uh, line is uh, important, and again, you won't hear this, but I did, um, uh, uh, but I did want to kind of finish out this um, uh, sentence. Often a translation is now that Jesus says to Mary, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. But another translation here is not don't touch me, which is kind of na nasty in a certain way, but rather do not hold on to me. That the way in which, and this would be the Joanine understanding, the way in which Jesus is now seen is not the same as he had been before. Something different has occurred. And so you can't hold on to the way in which you knew me, but must move forward now with a new and a new understanding. You must let go, if it were, of older perceptions of how Jesus was understood. Again, going back to something that Jesus had mentioned at the time of the supper, uh, where he had said, there are many dwelling places in my Father's house. I will find a way to be with you. I will be with you in a new, different presence, but nevertheless, be truly um, be with you. I have not yet ascended to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to my God, Jesus says. Now we will pick up this episode next time when uh, the gospel for the first, uh, for the second Sunday of Easter continues this narrative. But I did want to um, kind of make uh, the important point here that the first person to witness the resurrected Jesus is none other than Mary Magdalene. And she does go back to the disciples and says, and these are perhaps the five most famous words that come from John's gospel, I have seen the Lord. Well, okay, but uh, anyway, I've seen the risen Lord. And she is the first pictured to proclaim the good news of Jesus' resurrection. And that puts Mary Magdalene in a very beautiful and important role with regard to the resurrection story. Unfortunately, as I say, it is mentioned and not mentioned. When she looked into the tomb and she found, by the way, these two angels, one seated on each side of the place where Jesus was buried. One might see an analogy here to what was known as the Ark of the Covenant, because that, of course, had been the famous Ark that the Israelites had carried with them as they journeyed out of the uh, land of Egypt to the land of promise, that the two cherubims had sat on either side of the Ark of the Covenant, and in the middle, empty would be the place where God would reside. Could that be what John, who was very aware of Old Testament and Hebrew understanding, had said, that in the empty tomb, the Ark of the Covenant was now gone, that Jesus, who had resided there, had now ascended, and um, a new beginning, a new understanding, has taken place. So I mention all of these things, again, to point out that the Joannine writer, and we will have opportunities as we move along with this to point these things out again, is very familiar with the Old Testament, is very Jewish in his understanding, and uh, it's important to notice this as he narrates his story. So, um, I have to always smile as we come to an end of these. And, and I encourage you to look at all the readings that are connected with the story of the resurrection. Always kind of smile that verse eight of my, going back again to Mark is left out uh, because uh, the understanding 
the mystery, the wonder of God, and it is interesting here, raising Jesus up uh, is so very important. It is the back background and basis of our beliefs. It is what we celebrate on this Easter Sunday. It is what we celebrate each, each weekend when we gather at the table of the Lord to celebrate the risen Lord's presence among us. Thank you for being with us. Very, my very best wishes for a happy Easter and Easter season to all.